307. Today we will talk about psychopathology, mental health disorders, psychiatric diagnosis, psychological issues. So this is a topic that has a direct application, as you can imagine, to both professional spheres as well as to private circumstances. Um, and I would like to start with a big, big disclaimer or clarification, you could say. Uh, this is an introductory course in psychology, and this means that the knowledge required to pass the quizzes and other assignments, it's not necessarily just basic, but should not be viewed and utilized as a substitute for solid, registered, approved, licensed, psychological, or the really psychiatric uh, expertise and diagnostic investigations. I mention this because uh, it's always very difficult to ask for help for oneself or for others when it comes to psychological disorders. Yes, I do agree that uh, in the US we did uh, quite uh, a marvelous job in terms of mitigating the stigmatization of mental health disorders. And to some extent, the United States should be proud of what they accomplished in that area so that there is more support for uh, individuals struggling with mental health disorders and issues in general. But at the same time, we come from a long series of mistakes, to put it mildly, within the field of psychiatry and psychology, mistakes that had a very negative impact on the way we perceive ourselves and the interaction with the world. So as you can imagine, since those mistakes uh, have been made both in non-expertise area of work as well as by professionals, it's extremely important not to jump to conclusions uh, about any of the things I'm about to share with all of you today. Now, there are two possible uh, mistakes or type one, type two errors that uh, a person might encounter. One would be the mistake of under-diagnosing a problem, asking it, well, I understand why I do certain things, why I experience certain things, or why another person does the same. And therefore, you know, a YouTube lecture is enough uh, for me to get help and get uh, my life, uh, you know, more in balance. I don't really need any intervention, I don't need any diagnosis. I don't need any expert or professional to tell me who I am, what I experience, and what to do. That's a very important mistake that unfortunately uh, is part of the current state of affair. We'll talk more about that, the distrust uh, of science and scientific institutions. But the other equally problematic uh, mistake that people might do is to over-diagnose oneself just on the basis of something that they read on the internet or on the basic on the video that uh, you might have watched. Now, I want to guarantee that everything I'm about to share here is, is based on science and current scientific understanding of the issues that we debate. But nobody should substitute an academic training and clinical practice with a few YouTube video lectures you have watched. This is not just a question of titles or hierarchy or prestige. It's a question of safety and understanding. Please do not do that to yourself or others every time you uh, encounter some piece of advice on the internet. Always go back to the sources, ask for information, and to some extent also trust the knowledge of professional, which is what I'm about to discuss next. We mentioned trust a few times this semester. Uh, we mentioned trust and truth. And today uh, I don't want to uh, um, discuss the philosophical aspect here, but. I want to at least pay uh, some attention to the connection between these two uh, elements here. And before we, we discuss the details of psychopathology, let's see uh, what I'm asking you to do today. So truth and trust. Well, I would say this, that our college and university system, it's by no means perfect. But I also like to ask you, what is the substitute for it? Now, you might have had poor experiences with uh, certain elements of the educational system in the US or elsewhere, and you might have been hurt by the way uh, things were presented to you, by the way things were being discussed to you, or by some lack of empathy in the way um, uh, your professor, your instructors uh, approached you. 
But please, please, please be mindful of not substituting solid knowledge, solid education with things that are, for lack of a better term, very dubious in the way the presenter sources and also in the way they uh, might present a shortcut. In mental health, in health in general, shortcuts are usually not a good idea. So yes, uh, what I experience as an instructor is that we can do wonderful things and we can do not so wonderful things. And it's really a problem because very often if we do a poor job in the way we teach you things, then we might actually prevent you from finding the law for that subject. We might prevent you from actually developing a career that you might have found successful, useful, beneficial to you, satisfying, because we have a poor job explaining things to you. So bear with me. Um, our higher education system in the U.S. is facing a, an unprecedented crisis, a crisis of truth on one side, for sure, and a crisis of trust as well. And it's true for academia, it's true for science, it's true for medicine and healthcare in general. But please, uh, I'm asking you to consider that at the very least, at the very least, when we discuss complex topics such as the one we will present today, we are not in isolation. We always, that's you know, the expectation of academia, discuss those topics with colleagues, with fellow scientists, and there's a constant process of review. So yes, you might wonder, is college worthy? And can I just learn everything about psychological disorders on the internet? Well, I will always encourage you to navigate complexity by virtue of curiosity. So be open-minded. Don't necessarily take everything at face value in terms of never challenging the assumption. Please ask questions. And that's precisely why I keep encouraging you uh, in sending me emails, writing comments, because there's never enough time to cover everything. But at the same time, unless you have a fairly scientifically based reason not to trust academia in general, or science in general, please bear with me and see if you can benefit from this path that we're taking together. So this is just a brief introduction to this uh, complex issue because I really want to make sure that we understand that there are certain issues that should not be interpreted as tossing with a baby with a bath water. Okay? All right, trust and truth. So what is the topic of today's lecture? The topic is psychopathology and disorders, all right? So the term psychopathology is pretty self-explanatory, okay, psychopathology. So pathology related to the psyche, okay? And whether we want to link this to either psychological, psychological, let's say issues, problems, or to psychiatric, Disorders, disorders, that is more about conversation as to do with anthropology, philosophy, and etymology rather than with the empirical evidence that we are about to discuss today. So in any case, today we talk about things that do not go well, so to speak, when things are presenting themselves as an interruption to balance, to life uh, circumstances to expectations of well-being of self-esteem of love of empathy and so we're talking about one of the main reasons why people go to psychologists therapists psychiatrists uh nurses nurse practitioners um etc to find solace but also to find solutions understanding of the problem okay and um there is so much information about psychology and psychiatry on the internet that uh, the main focus of this lecture will be discussing diagnostic elements, clinical assessments, interviews, and labels. Okay? Now, the first thing I want to mention is this. Um, the consensus, at least in the U.S., all right, is that there is a relation between disorder, okay, and at this level, I will not specify the difference between disorder, disease, illness, problems, okay, we did that before, and I encourage you to watch other lectures that discuss the words, but the connection between a disorder, okay, and a 
chemical underpinning, right? So this is the assumption, okay, assumption, right? Now, if you remember our discussion on the mind-body problem, on this side, of course, you might find everything, okay? So you could say here that this could be just theory, and by just, I don't mean in a negative sense, it can be a focus on the mind, psychological processes, but some, or uh, social aspects, okay? Even cultural, linguistic aspects, etc. okay? All of the above, okay? All of this could be applicable, okay? A disorder can be a disorder in a variety of situations. But if we think about chemical underpinnings, okay, in this context, we mean matter, okay? Biology, neuroscience, okay? Neuroscience, okay? Um, I had a video on depression that I'll be happy to link uh, below where I discuss uh, the problems in having an extremist point of view where you have either just one thing without the other or the other way around. But to sum up some of this perspective, as I mentioned before, this can be both good and bad for one's own uh, path towards uh, healing. So if you think that all your problems, and I'm going to use you as an example, but this, of course, applies to all of us. If you use, uh, if you view, sorry, your problem as part of, for lack of a better term, your interpretation, okay, then you might, you might have some positive and some negative effects. So if everything is about your interpretation, you might think, well, the problem is not so big, therefore I should be able to face my issues uh, myself and I don't have anything else or anybody else to quote unquote blame, okay? So if you're successful, you feel a sense of accomplishment, okay? But if you don't get successful, then you feel that you are the problem, you as you, the way you interpret things, okay? The opposite is true if you have more of a matter-based, materialistic, or logistic explanation, in which case it's no longer interpretation, but again, it's your body, okay? Or your brain, okay? So you have problems because you have a brain problem, okay? So to give you an analogy, kind of a poor analogy, let's assume that you are a Formula One driver, a professional driver, and uh, you're you know, really good, uh, and you never really uh, achieved much in the in the competition in the race. You're always like twenty or twenty first um, in the ranking, right? So if you're not doing a good job and you think that the problem is the car, okay, then you might to some extent excuse yourself because it's not your fault, okay. However, the downside of that is, well, it doesn't matter how how good I am of a driver. If my car doesn't function properly, it will be to no avail. I will be doomed to always end up, you know, at the end of the ranking scale. And therefore, I'll be always doomed to have mental issues, psychological problems, regardless of how much work I put into it. So this is a very brief summary. The idea is that there's always a balance between nature, quote unquote, and nurture on the other side. So... That said, why is this assumption still true or is it in the US? Now, I want to mention something. Uh, first of all, let me put it this way. This assumption was based on the fact that psychiatry and psychology as a field, okay, and put them both in the same basket here, attempt to explain things in the most scientific way, which is great if you really think about it. We should always try our best to explain things in a scientific way. Why is that the case? Well, because if everything is about personal interpretation, then we can make mistakes. We can make mistakes as a clinician, uh, as, a, as a physician, as a researcher, as a scientist, okay? And in fact, later on, we'll see that there were situations where um, some studies have indicated that the diagnostic tools that psychiatrists used were so subjective that 
the same, exactly same clinical presentation led to a variety of different diagnoses. So a person might have received the diagnosis of schizophrenia. Uh, and another person might have received the diagnosis of bipolar disorder. Another person might have received a diagnosis of adjustment disorder or some psychotic trait. And so either this is all scientific or if it's only subjective, what's the point of trying to get to the bottom of it? If I go to this doctor and this doctor will tell me something, I go to this other doctor, she will tell me something else. What am I? What at least am I suffering from? So having science, the primary way to understand uh, psychological disorder is indeed a good thing. And that's precisely why there is an element of trust that uh, we should have toward at least academic and research institutions, okay? So the assumption is that at the very least, we need to focus on something that we can measure, all right? So a uh, uh, simplified notion will be you are not depressed because of the way you interpret things. Or at the very least, this is not the ultimate full answer. You are depressed because of chemical imbalances in your brain. Same thing for you are not experiencing a manic phase because you're very enthusiastic about what's happening or because you did not uh, understand the situation precisely because you have a chemical imbalance. Okay? Now, uh, before we see whether this uh, uh, attitude is correct or not, the question a lot of people might have is that, okay, if there is such thing as a chemical imbalance, okay, chemical imbalance, okay, and again, I should clarify, chemical refers to what we said in week two about neurotransmission, okay, neurotransmission, okay, and and this, of course, is not just chemical, but it's also um, 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 based on, on electric processes, okay, if you think about the actual potential, okay, magnetic, etc. So, but at the very least, okay, we could agree that, yes, we can prove the fact that psychological processes can be affected by the chemistry of the brain, okay? I think from a scientific standpoint, this is a fact. Those things are, at the very least, connected, okay? Now, whether we can say more than correlation, whether we can say that the chemical imbalances is a causal factor, so from correlation to causation, the question would be, okay, if my mental health disorder is due to a chemical imbalance in my brain, okay, so you should be able to clarify what a chemical, you guessed it, balance is, okay? Big question mark. What does it mean to be balanced? And I'm not talking about philosophical or, or um, linguistic terms here. I'm talking about very specific, precise terms. In other words, just tell me, please, what should be my dopamine, serotonin, noradrenaline, et cetera. I don't have room here. Levels, okay? Tell me specifically what levels I should have to be balanced, okay? So you can say, if you're thinking of your brain as, I don't know, the um, oil uh, filter of your car, okay, for instance, tell me exactly how much oil I need to have to have balance so I don't suffer anymore, okay? Tell me how much um, uh, pressure I need to inflate my tires with, okay? So I'm not driving, you know, uh, in, with, with some level of dangers. Uh, please tell me how many RPMs, run per minute, uh, my engine should uh, indicate so that I, when I switch gears, I don't damage my engine, okay? Is it a diesel engine? Is it a fuel engine, okay? Is it 1,500 RPMs correct? Is it 2,000, okay? Is it a sports car, okay? You need to be precise in the values. And that's where we have to admit that we do not have an answer, okay? We don't have an answer, and I dare to say, thankfully, we don't have an answer. Because if we had conditional precise values for all of this, this would also mean that either you have that specific value, otherwise you are not normal. And this is where we have, unfortunately, 
to discuss some linguistic elements, okay? Normal, okay? Now, uh, before we continue, let's just think of this. If all of this is true, we need to define things with precision, all right? And before we continue, I just want to spend just a few seconds, really, talking about this, okay? What is normal, okay? The short answer would be something that is related to the norm, okay? Something that is related to the norm. So something that, in an empirical sense, experiential sense, scientific sense, statistical sense, is the norm, what we can observe as the norm. Notice, I'm not saying that this is moral or less moral, ethical or less ethical, uh, preferable or less preferable. We're talking about the, you could say, the incidence or at the very least the prevalence okay, of the norm. Now, I would like you to uh, please keep in mind these two terms, okay, incidence, incidence on one side and prevalence on the other side, because the latter term especially is the one that is utilized uh, within psychiatric diagnostics the most. We'll talk about that later. Okay? But in case, what you observe in the general population. Okay? And you might wonder, okay, well, this is, yet again, uh, Dr. Tomasi spending a lot of time on, on the words. But keep this in mind. A lot of diagnostics, the way we understand mental health disorder, is indeed based on words, is indeed based on labels. Now, before we continue, I would like to show you a clip from a uh, movie that uh, talks a little about that. So let's reconvene out. Okay. Now, the three things the Greeks did for Astronomy, philosophy, and democracy. Bravo, very good. Now, give me a word. Any word, and I show you how the root of that word is Greek. Okay? How about arachnophobia? Arachna, that comes from the Greek word for spider, and phobia is a phobia, is, I mean fear. So fear of spider, there you go. All right, so uh, a funny movie that um, I'm um, very fond of because uh, it actually provides a really good uh, way to explain this. Um, now, uh, jokes aside, uh, the reason why it's important to understand the terminology here is because the terminology will determine the specific recommendations and the specific diagnostic framework that we would utilize in, in this context, psychological disorder. So it's the best chance you have to understand what the word actually means so that you understand what the doctor is telling you. Sometimes, unfortunately, even despite what the doctor might or might not remember, because this is another issue within science. Science progresses, but science also forgets, as we've seen before in the previous lecture. So, for instance, if a person, okay, will tell you that, again, in terms of the current prevalence, okay, of uh, the disorders, okay, I don't know, out of 100 people, this is not accurate. This is just something, out of 100 people, okay, about 20% of them are actually depressed, okay? okay? And maybe 10% of the 100, not of this 27, uh, have, I don't know, um, let's see, um, what would be a good example that I can give you outside of psychiatry? Maybe, um, um, let's say, um, dermatitis, okay? Okay. Or they might have, uh, let's do five people, five people might have a concussion. So very different diagnosis, okay? Um, so uh, if the psychiatric diagnosis, the psychological diagnosis is just the same as any other medical diagnosis, okay, so this is the other assumption I mean, okay, in discussing what normal is, okay, if psychiatry, okay, 
is exactly the same as medicine or it's a subfield of medicine that whatever diagnostic tools we use in psychiatry, sorry, in medicine, it should be applicable to psychiatry. So this is a assumption, okay? So this could mean that before we receive diagnosis A, B, or C, okay, these hundred people, okay, did not know what's going on, okay? They might have suffered from, respectively, depression, rheumatitis, or concussion, but they did not actually know what they were suffering from until they received the proper diagnosis. Now, assuming that the diagnosis is correct, so we're not talking about a medical error, receiving a correct diagnosis is in itself very often already helpful. First of all, you feel hurt, okay? The doctor will not tell you, you're just making stuff up. You're just experiencing things that are not true. And by the way, there is indeed a psychiatric term for that type of presentation as well. A presentation that the patient might suffer from that the doctor cannot recognize according to current scientific knowledge. Okay, we'll talk about that. But you might also feel that, oh, thankfully, someone finally understands me and understands me in a way that can also help me. As opposed to you go to the doctor, and the doctor never ever encounter a patient like yourself and the doctor will tell you, I'm sorry, I really don't know what to do. I've never seen anything like that in my life. I have no clue what the cause of this is, what the solution might be, what type of treatment, what type of diagnosis and what type of prognosis um, we have to expect. This is really uh, hard and, um, and emotionally and cognitively hard to accept. So having diagnosis is usually a good thing. Now, the downside of that, of course, is that it might add the anxiety, it might add some sort of self-blame and extra labeling being diagnosed with something. But what the movie uh, um, that I just showed you uh, indicates is that words are also just words. So if we were to use that here, then with depression, we might confuse, in the sense, I mean, etymologically fusing together sadness, okay? This is not true. We'll see that. With dermatitis, maybe some skin problem. Let's call it skin rush. Okay. Okay. We can uh, cash in maybe, uh, I don't know, uh, your head, poop or something like that. Okay. Okay. Um, and so at this point, the interesting thing is that there is a we call it a semantic drift or a linguistic delivery drift between the meaning of the word and the way the word is utilized. So just imagine, okay, if a person uh, comes to you, you're, you're a physician or a therapist, and the person says, well, I've been suffering from A, B, C, and D, and they give you a, a general presentation. And the doctor might say, well, based on what you're telling me, what you're observing, you might suffer from depression, okay? And you might reply, Oh, I see. That makes sense. I always thought I was suffering from sadness, but there's more to it. Okay. And this will be a good assessment because depression, as we will see, has a lot of quote unquote just, quote unquote just, uh, physiological component. Okay. Not just emotional component. Fatigue, for instance. Okay. Tiredness would be one of them. So, in this sense, depression is more than just sadness. Okay. But then if you'd go here or here, actually, you, you might say, well, you know, I, I hit my head and my head was banging against, I don't know, the, the car seat. Um, and the doctor said, well, it looks like you have a concussion, okay? And you might say, oh, what? Oh, I didn't know it was that bad. I thought my, my head just hit the, the car seat and shook a little bit. Now, in this context, it will be just a tautological examination, okay? A obvious, uh, obvious, um, label okay you're not editing else you're just using two different terms for the same thing um in this context you might have an in-between situation be be within dermatitis as the name implies okay has to do with the skin derma right in, in greek and the, the problem itself the medical diagnosis itself which might or might not be synonymous with skin rush so here's the thing uh, the way we interpret words, especially the redirected at ourselves, will indeed determine our uh, healing path. Okay, I mean this in the most serious way. 
words are not everything in medicine, but they play an extremely important um, role in diagnosis, especially in psychiatric diagnosis, okay? So in other words, saying the exact same thing, using a medical term might or might not contribute to the problem, either in a good way, because you feel hurt, if you understood, or in a very bad way, where you are magnifying the issue to the point that you might feel there is no help, okay? So this is in connection to the norm. Now, there will be a lot of philosophical conversation about what is normal, and I think there are, again, two opposite ways to misinterpret that, okay? Both of which have to do more with socially constructed terms. On one side, norm as in, uh, let's use it socially or socioculturally appropriate, okay? Appropriate, okay? And the other one simply, Let's just call it mathematics, okay? Mathematics, okay? So in the latter case, uh, you probably heard some pundits on TV saying things such as uh, facts don't care about, fill the blank here, your opinions, your emotions, your feelings, facts are facts. Now, the problem with this statement is that it is true when it's confined with the mathematical or logical investigation. Okay? Facts are pretty specific. And the fact that you know, two plus two is four is a mathematical fact that can be demonstrated logically speaking. Okay? Regardless if you have an empirical evidence of the fact that, I don't know, two items plus two more items will give you four, you can rationalize it sorry, rationalize, you can rationally demonstrate in a logical sequence, okay? But in the context of psychiatric diagnosis, you can really disregard your emotions, your opinions, your feelings as non-relevant because so much about our psychological health is indeed connected to our emotions, feelings, opinions, perception, et cetera, et cetera. Careful, because that might also leave another problem open. If we only base our diagnosis to the level of emotions, opinions, or feelings, then we might not represent the truth, okay? And this applies both to the patient as well as to the clinician. For instance, you might quote, unquote, unquote, feel that your depression will never be lifted by anything, by psychotherapy, medication, family supports, friends, okay? And despite the fact that you might feel that way, you have to learn not necessarily to ignore, suppress, or repress that emotion, but to contextualize it and prove it to yourself, first and foremost, that this is not the ultimate truth, that you can overcome depression. So emotions alone are not enough, okay? Now, by sociocultural appropriate, I also want to mention this, that our current state of affairs in psychiatry is, like it or not, still the byproduct of what happened in, I would say, the last 300, 350 years. We mentioned this in lecture one. So this um, um, positivistic attitude, I will not spend too much time on this. Think of um, the scientific um, environment within the uh, age of enlightenment in Europe, okay? okay, especially in Northwestern Europe, okay? And, and the other is the sense of, um, I would say the influence of psychoanalysis, okay? Psychoanalysis, especially Freud analysis, okay? Especially Freud. Now we encountered Freud last week when we talked about dreams, but one of the assumptions that Freud has uh, to make, that had to make, is that society in itself is, I'm oversimplifying things here, okay? Um, society has a role of control in the best case scenario, but suppression, repression, judgment, confinement, constriction, choking, um, keeping people prisoners in the worst case scenario, all right? 
So when we think that being normal is what is socio-culturally appropriate, immediately on an emotional sense, we feel that this is not a good thing, okay? Uh, I should not be told how to feel or exist in society, okay? Because anybody who tells me otherwise is trying to confine me or to control me, okay? This is a very important thing because a lot of criticism towards psychiatry are entirely justified, okay? Uh, the criticism about over-medication, for instance, the opioid crisis, okay? Uh, some level of forced hospitalization. All the criticism is entirely justified on historical, uh, bioscientific, as well as philosophical terms. And by philosophical, I mean ethical and moral terms, entirely justified. But there are other criticisms, however, that are really missing the point altogether. As in, psychiatrists, psychologists, therapists, etc., want to control me and tell me what to do. And this itself is bad. Well, it is not morally or ethically bad if they might actually have some of the things that might improve your life, okay? The same way as a proper uh, parental figure, a father or mother, might tell you things that you might not like on an emotional or uh, interpretation, uh, subjective interpretation level, but this thing they might tell you to do and they expect you to do is nevertheless good for you, okay? So careful when we utilize this as a way to criticize psychological assessment in general. All right, so um, the last thing I want to mention before we uh, will uh, um, learn with the help of some slides is, uh, again, part of the criticisms uh, that you might encounter in the context of psychiatry and psychology, okay? So um, last week I mentioned a few names. I will mention a few names now, uh, although we encountered some of them previously, and now we'll show you uh, some videos and some slides to explain further their perspective. So uh, perhaps uh, we can start with the name of Thomas Sass. Okay. Hungarian, uh, we encountered before Dietrich Schönemann, Austrian, um, Sandy or Sandra Steingard, American, and American is also uh, Robert Whitaker. and perhaps even Peter Bregan, okay? Peter Bregan, okay? Uh, all of them, except for Whitaker, are, um, uh, are doctors and uh, experts within the field of psychiatry, uh, psychology, medicine in general. And very often they are known in the, I don't know, public domain of the internet as members of the anti psychiatric movement. I tend to disagree with this notion, okay? Uh, first of all, because the anti-psychiatric movement is very complex and there's a huge portion of the movement that um, I would deem to be uh, conspiratorial in nature, okay? And they are all very, this is my assumption, uh, predicated on the fact that I know them well and I work with some of them um, uh, for several years, and I know their research and I know their clinical attitude. They're very, very well balanced researchers. So uh, I don't really like these terms, but I want you to be aware of the fact that there is such thing as an anti psychiatric movement, especially within the United States. Okay? There is another quote unquote anti psychiatric movement that originated in Europe and from Europe eventually spread throughout the world. Okay? Um, and that is the movement that was connected to Dr. Basaglia, okay? Right. Now, before we continue, I want to show you uh, a little video uh, by uh, Dr. Sass that uh, it's an extra from uh, an interview he had uh, years ago where he talks about, let me use the term, socio-emotional expectations in uh, psychiatry in the US. So let's take a look at this uh, brief interview. People looked upon life as a veil of tears, that's a Catholic expression, mm -hmm. and you wait until you die and then you'll be happy in, in the afterlife. 
that was the whole idea throughout human history until the last 50 years in America. In Eastern Europe, I don't think people expect to be happy, like here. In Eastern Europe? Yeah. Eastern Europe's been under communism for... Right. They expect to be free. Quite a few years. Not, not happy. Right. See, freedom gives you the opportunity to be unhappy and not to be molested for it. Mm -hmm. I look upon the mental health profession today as a gigantic apparatus of molestation. Molestation? That's a loaded word. Yeah. How do you mean it? Intrusive. Mm -hmm. Intrusive. The average person doesn't know how to resist mm -hmm. mental health help. Look how much of it is directed to the three helpless groups, children, old people, prisoners. Prisoners are full of psychiatric drugs now. Huh. Right? They go to jail for drugs. They go to jail for the drugs, and then they get, they get go to jail for the drugs they like to take, and then they are, when they're in jail, they are forced to take the drugs they don't want to take. Mm -hmm. That in some ways characterizes the American drug scene today. The drugs people want to take are illegal, and the drugs they don't want to take, psychiatry forces on them. Mm -hmm. And the mental health profession does not complain about this. On the contrary, it supports this. One of the things we might or might not disagree uh, with um, the perspective presented by Dr. Sass is that there seems to be an interpretation that's very subjective in a lot of things about psychiatry. Now, uh, since his criticism, in, at least in this interview, was mostly uh, uh, targeted at the way psychiatry has been developing uh, in the United States, let's talk about the United States itself. Now, where do we find diagnostic tools in psychiatry in the United States? Well, the main source, let me uh, grab it right here for you. If one day you want to go uh, to become a therapist uh, or a psychologist or at least a psychiatrist, you might be, have to uh, familiarize yourself with these two big textbooks, okay? Uh, uh, I use the term textbooks in a broader sense. One is this one has to do with neuropsychology, clinical neuropsychology. The other one is the book, the DSM. Now, in this context, I'm talking about the fifth edition, uh, revised, but uh, those are the two books that you will encounter all the time. Now, before we continue, I just want to mention that uh, at the time of the recording of these videos, those two are the most recent, recent versions, but of course, there will be new versions. But in any case, the first thing you notice is that both books are published by the APA. And what is the APA? Well, the first answer is it's not just one, okay, but there are two. One is the APA as American. Psychological Association. And the other one is the American Psychiatric Association. All right. Now, of course, being creative might not be their forte because. In both cases, we're talking about APA, all right? Now, there is a bit of competition between the two. So <laughs> if you as the first one, you say, well, this one is a capitalized APA versus the second one is this APA. But if you ask this association, they'll say the opposite. We are the capitalized APA and they are the APA. Okay? Now, jokes aside, a uh, few things we can say about these two uh, associations. All right, so first of all, um, the term might appear synonymous. Okay, American, American, association, association, psychological, psychiatric, well, for the most part, it's kind of the same thing, but we'll see if that is true. But the first thing I want to mention is that there's really a bit of a misnomer in the sense that uh, neither really is American, okay, but only U.S., U.S. Psychology Association and U.S. Psychiatric Association. In fact, 
especially when we're talking about the DSM, which is published by the latter, okay, the American Psychiatric Association publishes the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, all right, DSM, okay, DSM, okay. Uh, it is published by the American Psychiatric Association in the U.S., but it's really utilized mostly in the U.S. and to some less extent in Canada as well. But the rest of the American countries do not necessarily use the DSM, and definitely the DSM is not as widely utilized anywhere else in the world, okay? So you might wonder, okay, so is the DSM just something that's focused on U.S. mental health? Well, part of the answer should be yes, and it is yes. Notice. We're talking about diagnostic and statistical analysis. So a lot of the research upon which the DSM is based is scientific. It should be uh, taken as such, should not be criticized in that sense. It's a really good manual in that sense. But keep in mind that a lot of the research is based in the US, okay? So if you think about other North American countries like Mexico, for instance, or other countries in general, then some of the statistics might not fully align with the research. Yet again, please keep in mind that this does not mean that DSM is lying or portraying a picture is not accurate. It's simply focused on the US. So American might be a little bit of a, of a misnomer, okay? Second thing, you might wonder, okay, but if the DSM is so popular, what else uh, does the rest of the world use for diagnostic purposes in psychology or psychiatry? And the answer would be the ICD. The International Classification of Diseases, ICD, all right? So you say, okay, if the DSM is published by the American Psychiatric Association, is the ICD published by the, I don't know, World Psychiatric Association? The answer is uh, not quite, because the ICD, it's not only about psychiatry, but it's about healthcare, about medicine in general. So it's published, by the World Health Organization, which is not the same as the World Medical Association. It's not the same as the World Psychiatric Association. It's not the same as the World Psychological Association, okay? I mentioned this not because you have necessarily to defend the WHO in all aspects, but at the very least, the team of researchers, doctors, and physicians behind the ICD is an international team. And so at the very least, you have some level of uh, scientific understanding that's broader in scope and research in comparison to the APA. One more thing before we continue. So we mentioned, okay, should be really US rather than American. Uh, what about psychology and psychiatry? Aren't those pretty much the same thing? Well, we briefly discussed that in week one. Uh, I just want to mention a few things. Uh, that might surprise some of you, all right, because the assumption in the U.S., not in the rest of the world, not in the rest of America, and not even in the rest of North America, the assumption is that psychiatrists are doctors, okay? And you might wonder, oh, well, wait a second, brace yourself, what are you telling us? Are psychiatrists not doctors? Yes, if we understand the term doctrine one way, not if we understand it in the way it's interpreted somewhere else. So a psychiatrist, okay, in the US, okay, is an MD, all right, or a DO at the very least, okay, that specializes in psychiatry, all right? Outside of the US, the degree itself for medicine is different. For instance, here in Canada, you might have a Bachelor of Medicine and BBS, okay? Uh, medicine Bachelor, Bachelor of Surgery, Latin or English, okay? But this does not mean that a, a physician with an MBBS is less than an MD or DO, okay? Doctor of Osteopathic Medicine, Doctor of Medicine. Okay? It simply means that outside of the United States, okay? Whether you have a United States MDDO or a, let's say, a British or Commonwealth or Australian or Canadian MBBS, you are at the same level, but you might be referred to as physician, not 
doctor. All right. Why is that? Because the term doctor is only reserved to scientists, clinician researchers who do actually achieve a real doctorate, a PhD. And of course, the PhD is not the only doctorate. You have professional doctors such as an EDD, doctor of education, PsyD, doctor of psychology, and then you have even higher doctorates such as the Dr. Nauk in the former Soviet Union and um, and uh, um, the Warsaw Pact, former Warsaw Pact country, which sometimes is translated as DSC or SCD, Doctor of Sciences, which is achieved after a PhD. But regardless of that, the assumption is that to treat mental health disorder, you might need to be either an MD or an MBPS. No. The truth is that each country has its own regulations, would you speak? In the United States, for the most part, a psychologist, for the most part, most states within the US need to have a doctorate, okay? In most states, a psychologist needs to have a doctorate. A psychiatrist does not need to have a doctorate, okay? To make things even more complicated, in the United States, for the most part, an MD or DO do uh, have both of them do have prescription powers, which means that they can prescribe medications on top of being able to diagnose and treat mental health disorders. A psychologist, even if he or she has a higher degree than a physician, might not have a prescription power. Okay. Other distinction might be also the fact that a doctorate, as we seen in week one might require a full research study in order to, uh, for the doctor to be awarded. In medical school, this is not necessarily the obvious case. It's not a full requirement. Now, there are exceptions to this. I want to be clear, especially uh, since we are talking about uh, the United States. In Vermont, for instance, to be a psychologist, you need to have a master degree at least, okay? So that's why um, those degrees often are called the M degrees, okay? So uh, this is just to simplify things here. It's, it's a complex situation. And again, the scope of this lecture is psychiatric disorders, but I just want to mention this so you know who can actually diagnose and treat. So there are tons of different degrees, but in terms of academia, okay, you have, I would say, three main layers, okay? The so-called B degrees, Okay, the M degrees, okay, and the D degrees, okay? It's an oversimplified version of the thing. So B degrees really mean bachelor, okay? M degrees, so BA, um, BS, um, etc. M degrees, MA, MS, MD, etc. And then the doctoral level, PhDs, EDDs, PsyDs, etc. Right? Now, this is not arbitrary. This is called the Bologna process after the name of the first university in the world, the University of Bologna. Okay? I mentioned this before. Uh, yes, there were other institutions of higher education in uh, Egypt, in Tunisia, in Morocco, um, in India, etc. that predate uh, the University of Bologna, but in terms of uh, university itself as a higher uh, education institute, with that name, awarded degrees, University of Bologna is the first one in the world in history. And that's why to this day, the process of Bologna decides the hierarchy of degrees. So, a person who might deal with mental health disorder might belong to any of this. In fact, you might even help patients if you have a lower degree, like for instance, an A degree, okay? I don't know, an associate of science, um, um, et cetera, okay? Because the, the idea is dividing 
the main clinical scope. So the higher, the broader overall your scope of practice. If we study mental health disorders, okay, in general, in general, you have this triad, treat, heal, cure, okay? But in practice, psychological disorder can be addressed with quote unquote, talk, therapy, um, medications, so pharmacological intervention, okay? Or medical procedures, okay? All right. So I mentioned it because I want you to get the most of, out of this course. And so hopefully I will also clarify some things uh, if you want to move forward in your career and actually work in the mental health field. So you have some understanding of what steps to take. Uh, and if you are taking this course and you're already a professional, this might actually help clarify what you can do in the position of clinical supervisor, for instance. So who can do talk therapy? I would say for the most part, anybody can talk to people to make them feel better. There, there should not be any clinical restriction per se, okay? You can talk to a friend. In fact, you should talk to a friend. This is essential in a lot of mental health uh, debate that uh, having good friends might not be a substitute and should not be a substitute for medical diagnosis and treatment, but is typically a significant part of everyday life improvement. Okay? For the obvious reason, if the research was not corroborating this, and it does, for the obvious reason that you will spend only a certain amount of time with a doctor or with a therapist or with a physician or with a psychiatrist, but you spend a lot of more time within your environment, friends, acquaintances, family members. So talking is essential. It's also true that if you're not trained, Talking alone might be detrimental, and you actually receive very poor advice, very negative advice, in fact, even dangerous advice, things that you should not do, because not everybody's an expert in the field. Okay? However, within talk therapy, you don't need to have a PhD and not even an MD. All right. You can start even without any degrees whatsoever. Um, in fact, uh, I would like to say this that while college and university education academia is extremely important to understand the science and the application there are some levels of i would say if not popular knowledge or folk knowledge i don't like those terms but instinctual experiential um, um generational knowledge that should not be discarded okay uh, in terms of people that live longer than yourself your grandmother your grandfather for instance might have very profound pieces of advice to understand what to do best in your life, even from a psychological standpoint, okay? Regardless if they have an academic degree or not. Now, in practice, depending which state you're in, if you want to practice talk therapy, but you don't have a degree, okay, some boards of mental health might require you to be registered or rostered, which simply means that the state where you operate, okay, whether you will refer to yourself as a coach or counselor or something of that sort, the state needs to know who you are, where you operate, and more importantly, what is your scope of practice. You cannot practice without a license, all right? So for instance, in practice, yes, you could be, I don't know, uh, working as an RN, as a registered nurse, okay? And if you're in Vermont at this stage, you don't need to have a bachelor in nursing. Um, you just need to be registered as a nurse. Again, at the time uh, of this of this lecture, things might change. But you might decide to get a certification in mental health counseling, for instance, okay? And you simply don't need to provide, uh, you want to provide your patients that assume you work in a, a surgical floor, and you simply want to be well-equipped to talk about psychological uh, problems with your patient. You don't want to diagnose, you don't want to treat, you simply want to be equipped, okay? So you might decide to become a rostered psychotherapist who is not licensed and not registered, okay? In order to, so to speak, cover the legal aspects, okay? Of your profession. And this has to do 
with the rules and regulation of the American Psychological Association or Counseling Association or Psychiatric Association, but even more important with the HIPAA rules and regulation, H-I-P-P-A, oh, sorry, H-I-P-A. But if you want to uh, be more, I'm using the term, clinically professional, you might want to go and obtain a bachelor or a master in coaching, counseling, uh, mental health counseling, especially, or you can specialize in addiction counseling. And even in that, you have to be careful about the rules and regulation of the state you work with. For instance, some states will allow a licensed clinical mental health counselor to provide, as it implies, mental health counseling. Some states require extra certification if the counseling is focused on addiction or on trauma or on PTSD, et cetera. Uh, there are other uh, hybrid uh, types of um, practices such as coaching. It's a bigger breath that doesn't really mean anything uh, clinically or legislatively speaking, but you might have some form of registration or license, say my license that might or might not be uh, awarded or recognized in the um, in the rest of the federation or, or, or abroad, uh, that would be, I don't know, a health coach, for instance, or wellness coach, well-being coach. But then, let me use uh, um, Vermont as an example. If you want to become someone who can also diagnose, right? And so the person that diagnose will be able to help the patient in a more professional level, you need to become a clinical psychologist. In Vermont, you can get to that path with a master degree, a master level licensed clinical psychologist, or just master level licensed psychologist. In the rest of the United States, with few exceptions, I think at this point there are four or five exceptions, you need to have a PhD or a PsyD in psychology to do that. Doctoral level psychologist or doctoral level clinical psychologist. And then you can have other specialization, the same way as a psychiatrist has other specialization in neuropsychology, for instance. Okay. So the multiple paths. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this, so feel free to ask me uh, specific uh, questions if you would like to uh, find out more. But at the end, you have to have this distinction. So talk therapy can be performed by everybody, which does not actually mean that everybody is good at providing talk therapy. Because talk therapy, it's not exactly the same as psychotherapist, okay? So if you are a clinical psychologist, by definition, you're also a psychotherapist in the US. In some countries in Europe, it's the other way around, the Netherlands, for instance. If you are um, a psychotherapist, you're automatically a psychologist, but not the other way around. But in the US, if you're a clinical psychologist, you're automatically a psychotherapist. If you're a psychiatrist, not necessarily, okay? because there's not the same amount of uh, coursework or clinical practice uh, dedicated into this practice. But in exchange for that, if you overall in the US, you become a psychiatrist, then you have more emphasis on pharmacology, psychopharmacology in general, okay? Because you have prescription powers, okay? Now, for the medical procedure, okay, uh, this is really complex. Um, and as the name implies, medical procedures can be performed by a medical professional, regardless of this person is an MD or has a full doctorate, okay, or has an MBBS, right, um, and therefore cannot be uh, performed by someone who has a doctorate in another field uh, outside of uh, medicine, unless this person also has a lower degree in medicine. In psychiatry, you might wonder, what type of procedure are we talking about? Well, you probably have heard of a very dark um, history in psychiatry, that uh, used to perform lobotomies, okay? You think about frontal lobes, but in modern day and age, in the US especially, you've probably heard of ECT, okay? ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, okay? The all electroshock. We could spend semesters talking about the benefits, real or not, ethical uh, components, uh, issues, applications. Is ECT only for depression? Can ECT also be beneficial for uh, other type of mood disorder? Are mood disorders still existing in the DSM-5, et cetera, et cetera? But I want to keep this lecture short, but this will be one of the example 
that it's not a surgical procedure. Okay, keep in mind that the degree MBBS means bachelor in medicine, bachelor in surgery, but it's nevertheless a medical procedure. Okay, and you might wonder, okay, what what was this relevant? Well, because traditionally speaking, aside from the Bologna level, there were other types of distinction where in the past, okay, and by the past I mean. Uh, since time immemorial, but it was really codified in the Renaissance, okay? The highest level was a D level, as usual. So you have doctors here, okay, doctors, okay? From the Latin docere or docere to teach, right? The level below, you had PH, physician, which is pretty much similar to this day, okay? And the level, um below physician was asked for surgeon okay now in the u.s from cultural reason uh it's not so true that a surgeon is the lowest of the pyramid followed by a physician followed by a doctor okay but in a historical sense the surgeon was the hands-on person the quote unquote 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 butcher of medicine the person who was very skilled at operating the physician was a person who not only had these skills, but also had uh, theoretical skills or theoretical approach skills, medical skill that he is, and the doctor was the one on top that could teach both, okay? In practice, the surgeon was assisting the physician, okay? And the physician was assisting the doctor. But then those terms kind of got all mixed together. But that explains the difference between a medical procedure, okay? as opposed to a surgical procedure. Uh, one more thing I want to mention is that um, aside from what your area of intervention is going to be, to treat mental health disorders, you cannot skip psychotherapy ever, right? I want to be clear about that. Yes, in terms of the effectiveness, efficacy, and efficiency, the triple E, those things are different, but you cannot avoid talking to people, okay? Efficiency, efficacy, effectiveness. And this is probably possibly the last uh, disclaimer uh, before we continue. Um, it should never be a question of choosing between medication or psychotherapy. It should be always an integration. Example, uh, too much and too little is usually a bad idea. How does it translate to uh, psychological disorders? Uh, there is no magic pill for anything. There is no magic pill that can create a content in your brain. Okay. A magic pill does not exist to give you purpose and meaning in life. However, you cannot solve problems that are, at the very least, presenting a very strong biological correlation, chemical correlation, potentially dangerous outcome. Think about a person who's experiencing a um, psychotic breakdown. I use this term in a broader sense. And this person might also have some suicidality, okay? or um, some uh, paranoid ideation, okay? This person might actually benefit from a more direct chemically-based approach in that moment, okay? Once the person's, the person's brain, the person's mind is, in, is presenting a more balanced and calm way, then you can approach the person and talk to this person. But there are situations and circumstances where you don't have an option, okay? So I want you to keep this in mind because it's never a good idea to be extreme in our assessment. Psychological disorders can be best understood and treated the more we understand about both psychopharmacology on one side and psychotherapy on the other side. All right, uh, one more thing, and then we take a look at the slides. Um, so we talk about uh, psychotherapy and medications, okay? So, so who's, who's prescribing medication and in, in, in this sense, it is a, a, a pharmacist or a pharmacologist, a doctor in pharmacology, the best equipped person? Uh, well, this is a complicated answer, but let's just, for the clarity, 
uh, purpose here, let's uh, compare uh, something like this, okay? Um, um, All right, so I'm talking about the US here. Yes, those terms are used in a different way abroad or elsewhere, but let's talk about the US. I mean, even more specific here, okay? Now, this one in general is called a research doctorate, okay? Okay, as opposed to these two that are not full doctorate per se, not academically speaking, that are called professional, quote unquote, doctorate or professional degrees, okay? One and two, okay? In some cases, they're called professional terminal degree, okay? Because it's the end of the training, the minimum training required, although you can still get a PhD, okay? Now, um, so who's prescribing medication? The PsyD, in this sense, is not at the same level of PhD in general, okay? For a simple reason that in the US, very often, not always, you can obtain a professional degree after your bachelor degree. So you can go from a bachelor straight to an MD or PsyD, okay? Versus elsewhere, in order to be awarded a PhD, you need to go through a master program first, okay? So you need to add that training, which it's not just coursework, but very often involves research and clinical practice, okay? The PsyD also is a doctor of psychology, the same as an MD is a quote unquote doctor of medicine. So they're very professionally based. A PhD is a doctor of philosophy simply because traditionally speaking in academia, philosophy indicated every field, okay? Love of knowledge or knowledge of law, right? Philosophy. But since you're talking about medication, you can also have a professional doctorate called PharmD, okay? Doctor of Pharmacy. Uh, in practice, if you're in a psychiatric unit, you might work in a multidisciplinary treatment team when you have full doctors, PhDs, and then you have MDs, PsyDs, PharmDs, RNs, APRNs, um, um, NPs, nurse practitioners, uh, PAs, uh, uh, physician assistant, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And so, in general, a PsyD, unless this person's privileges, prescription privileges, might not be able or allowed. By, by able, I don't mean they don't have the knowledge. They don't have the clinical and legal requirement to prescribe psychotropic medications. The MD will, indeed, okay? The PharmD is very often the person that in a multidisciplinary treatment team has the biggest amount of current scientific research in pharmacology. And so uh, he or she plays a fundamental role in the multidisciplinary treatment team. Okay? Keep in mind that yet again, you cannot be an expert in everything. So it's really, really healthy to have a multidisciplinary treatment team. So everybody brings the best of their profession. Okay? Psychologists in the psychotherapy realm. Um, uh, psychiatrists within the medical realm and pharmacologists, pharmacists in the pharmacological realm, the best of all them all. I also mentioned the anti-psychiatric movement real quick. And one of the things that uh, the Legge Basaglia, the Basaglia law was able to achieve in 1976, and even before that, uh, starting in Italy, and eventually it spread out throughout the world, was the destigmatization of mental health disorders. In practice, uh, in Italy, to these days, we don't have uh, locked units the same way as we have in the United States. Uh, they were abandoned a long time ago, and you know the United States is still struggling in comparison to Europe in this area. But of course, not everything is uh, cut and dry, black and white. Uh, from a destigmatization perspective, it's very useful uh, to see from a moral perspective how how good it is not to have anybody locking anybody up, so that the mental health becomes also a social problem, not just personal problem, okay? In fact, if you really think about it, from a diagnostic standpoint, it's always a connection between myself and others. So if I struggle with depression, very often I'm struggling in the interaction with the external world, okay? It's not true that I'm always depressed about something, okay? This is a misnomer, a misunderstanding, but our relationship with others is important. So being locked in very often is 
even more stigmatizing and preventing us from interacting in the world properly. And yet, if you do experience a very uh, intense psychotic breakdown, the ability to be monitored much closely, more closely than on average, might actually have a benefit. So as part of this evolution of the Legge Basalia, this uh, de-stigmatization, de-institutionalization of psychiatry, you also had an evolution of the so-called OD, open dialogue, which in itself can be quite problematic, uh, not because of its uh, personal position, but because of the way it was applied. Um, and um, again, this is something that could also take us a long, long time to discuss. Um, but the open dialogue model, which again originated in Italy from the same law, the legge, the law of Basaglia, okay, was very much popularized in Scandinavia, or rather Fenno Scandia, because Finland um, um, played a significant role in the um, application of uh, open dialogue. Um, but then the idea was to have the patient experiencing the diagnostic framework, the, the diagnostic discussion that otherwise would be confined to the uh, rounds, usually clinical morning rounds within the multidisciplinary treatment team, and the diagnosis and the and the prognosis and the treatment was discussed in the presence of the patient. Okay, in this sense, open, nothing hidden, so to speak, everything in front of the patient. The downside, in terms of the way open dialogue was applied, especially in the United States, is a problem of linguistic misunderstanding. Okay, because in the United States, one of the missing pieces is the misconception of the polite for you. And this is where, again, it's so interesting to understand how understanding words may play a fundamental clinical role. So what happened is that, keep in mind that open up model started in Italy, okay? And Italy, just as many other Indo-European languages, has different forms from you, okay? You have the informal you, so you can become informal you, to, okay? We're not talking about nominative here. We're not talking about uh, accusative or dative form to, okay? Then you have two form of politeness, okay? Lay, okay? And then boy, okay? You do have a fourth, loro, okay? Which only uh, refers or is usually used for uh, the pluralia majestatis for, uh, uh, royals or uh, for um, uh, monarchy related um, members of the nobility or the Pope, etc. So it's really not not much in use nowadays. So you have the option between informal you and these two. The problem with this is that in English, it's really not translatable in that sense, because two would be the old do, okay, which is the same as the German do okay okay or in slavic languages it could be the t okay etc um the lay will be the third person singular used as you as well okay so this one does not exist in english okay okay and it only exists in certain languages so it's missing in germanic languages as well and for the most part is also missing in the slavic languages as well the boy actually, is usually translated as you all, <laughs> you folks, okay, etc. It's a plural, okay, you guys, okay, okay, and in German, for instance, is Z, okay, capitalized, because otherwise it's the same as the Z, third person singular, she, okay, uh, in the Slavic languages, you have B, and then vas, bam, depending uh, if you have uh, accusative, dative, locative, et cetera, et cetera. In any case, to be polite in the presence of a person, you might, in languages other than English, use a you that's spelled out as he or she, for instance, or it, okay, third person, okay, or they, right? Now, this uh, gave rise to a misunderstanding where some psychiatrists in the U.S. now practice open dialogue and they talk about the person 
with actually addressing the person. For instance, let's assume that the person's name is David, just like me, okay, or David. And they might say, what do you think David is thinking about that? What do you think he is actually experiencing now? And then the purpose is to involve me in the conversation, but very often this appears and feels even more diminishing, derogatory almost, making fun of me, excluding me even further because, hey, I'm here. Why do you talk about me rather than talking to me? Okay. So it's a misunderstanding. Okay. Yes, there are some discussion that this has to do more with some psychodynamic approach where you externalize what's happening there. So talking about me in the third person, according to some, might have entangled this separation between me and the presentation I give of myself. But there are just as many um, researchers that indicate that the opposite is true. It might actually be so dangerous that it might even trigger some elements of dissociative features where I'm even further separated uh, from another part of myself. So this is just a general consideration about open dialogue in, in psychiatry and psychology. The idea is good. The intent is very noble and morally high, but the practical application might actually be more controversial and problematic. So now let's uh, dive into the diagnosis uh, labeling. Since this is a lecture on psychopathology, the next installment, so to speak, will be a list of mental health or psychological, psychiatric disorder issues, diseases, according to, again, the, the two big books, okay, especially the DSM. Uh, I already mentioned that just because I'm mentioning something in a clinical sense with labels, this should not be utilized to diagnose or treat anybody. This is an intro to psychology class, but also it should not be viewed as the ultimate last word about that disorder. In fact, all these um, uh, books and uh, resources, whether it's the DSM or the ICD, they're constantly updated. The ICD, I believe it's in the 11th, 11th B edition. The DSM is the fifth edition, but one thing that you might find in DSM-5 is that for the first time, compared to the previous four, they switch from the Latin numerals to the Arabic or Arabic Persian Indian numerals because the, the expectation is that you will have added versions. And so, as you can imagine, there was no problem in having something like this DSM one, two, three, four. Okay. Because it was just a one edition, you might have a revised edition. But with the five, if they want to do 5.1 or 5.2, et cetera, if you don't pay close attention, you might interpret this as six, seven, et cetera. So they decided to switch to the Arabic version of it. So you could have five plus one, 5.2, et cetera. So that will be more uh, um, readily and easily understood. So when I'm about to, what I'm about to discuss next is predicated upon the most recent version of the DSM-5, but I will mention a few considerations, okay? And this consideration has to do with the changes in overall attitudes about diagnostics. And one of the biggest changes is, again, this progressive biologistization, materialization, neuroscientization, or something like that, of psychiatric disorder. So one of the things that's been pretty much getting, is progressing, getting rid of, is the multi-axial diagnosis. And the multi-axial diagnosis has to do with all other elements that might be either corroborating or uh, representing comorbidities to mental health disorders, other things that can be added to it, okay? Uh, for instance, social elements, family elements, uh, overall uh, life functioning, et cetera, et cetera. And the idea was, the idea was good. The idea was, let's try to make sure that everything we say, okay, despite that nowhere here, there is a mention of etiology. Etiology is the medical origin of things, okay? Etiology, right? There's no mention, okay, anywhere here. There's only diagnostics and statistical, so just labeling, labeling based on prevalence, et cetera. But the researcher behind the DSM wanted to be as scientific as possible, which is a very noble uh, effort. And in practice, as I mentioned multiple times, 
what is the field that is the most scientific field in terms of empirical evidence-based field that could be linked to psychiatry psychology? Well, you could think biology, you could think of neuroscience. And so that's exactly what they did. They tried to link more and more psychological psychiatric disorder with the neural underpinnings, the neural correlates, which is very novel, okay? Because that, that should remove some of the um, subjective bias. So the problems I mentioned earlier with uh, the psychiatrist comes out with this disorder and the psychologist with another disorder, and a third psychiatrist, a third psychologist with different disorders. If we can narrow down to a very specific biological, neuroscientific evidence, then this should provide more of an objective way to uh, address the problem. So the attitude, the, uh, the overall goal is very noble. The problem is that it's disregarding and eliminating all the other things that outside of the United States, culturally speaking, historically speaking, medically speaking, are considered to be extremely important, even on causal level for the development um, and evolution of mental health disorders. Again, as I mentioned, the relationship with yourself and others, your family, your social context, your socioeconomic status, your system of belief, your spirituality, your religiosity, or lack thereof, your experience, et cetera, et cetera. None of which can be narrowed down to this or that chemical balance or to this or that neural underpinning. Okay? Which, by the way, is the same mistake that uh, um, another field that nowadays we will call pseudoscientific did in the past. I would say the first one, phrenology, if you remember that phrenology attempted to force materialistic, biologistic um, elements into things that were not by definition matter-based. And phrenology, again, uh, was part of this uh, um, uh, positivistic, scientific attitude that assumed that certain, you know, bumps and odd and quirky shapes of someone's skull could de develop, could determine whether a person was uh, more or less prone to develop psychosis or or, or depression, et cetera, et cetera. Complete nonsense, complete anti-scientific. In fact, very, very much connected to uh, other fields that, if you remember from lecture one, uh, are extremely problematic, such as eugenics, okay? Or the assumption that certain physical traits could determine certain behavior. Think about uh, physiognomics, physiognomics, and I will quote him again, uh, Cesare Lombroso, one of the most famous researcher and proponent of physiognomics. So just because something appears to be matter-based, physical-based, the link between the matter itself and the physiological and the psychological component, it's an assumption. It's not a demonstration, not a causal factor. And the same thing could be said about psychoanalysis. That's what Freud did too, right? Freud assumed that you could link anything that was not empirical per se, it was more either theoretical, philosophical, or even spiritual to something that can be universalized in a, in a clinical judgment way, okay? So he kind of created the perspective upside down. Not longer, there was a world of archetypes or symbols that uh, became embodied, became incarnated, so to speak, and carne, carne, so that means uh, physical property, physical body, flesh, right? But was the other one, the other way around. According to Freud, everything was a manifestation outwardly. We project things outwardly, okay? We project the idea of the great father or the great mother. We project the idea of God, okay? Or, or, or the devil, etc. not the other way around. So, this is very similar to what's happening to the DSM-5. In an attempt to become more scientific, more neuroscience-based, which is extremely important, good, morally good, scientifically good, it's exactly what we're supposed to do, we are risking yet again to toss the baby with the bathwater and removing this multi-axial diagnosis, multi-axial uh, part of the diagnostic intro. All right, so let's continue with some slides that uh, will uh, uh, 
uh, better present uh, psychological uh, disorders. And the first one is about the connection between psychology, psychiatry, neurology, and neuroscience. So the first question that we want, want to ask is, is there any difference between these fields? So in other words, are mental health disorders, psychiatric disorders, also neurological disorders, also disorders that we can investigate based on neuroscience, or are those disorders more socially constructed, for instance, uh, philosophically understood, uh, um, better um, discussed, treated from a um, social, personal, philosophical perspective or not? So the example that um, I want you to think about in this first slide um, is an example referred to Alzheimer's uh, as well as dementia. So in the picture here, you can see both the etiological factors um, in Alzheimer as well as some statistical analysis of both uh, frontotemporal dementia and Lewy body dementia. So um, in, in the Lewy body's dementia, you find between five and 10% in the beige um, portion of the, this um, um, uh, pie chart and from frontotemporal dementia between five and 10%. And the biggest portion of the pie with Alzheimer's dementia, 60 to 75%, mixed dementia 10 to 20, and vascular dementia between 10 and 20%. So dementias in general, dementias or dementia, depending on which plural you want to use, are neurologic disorders characterized by a slow deterioration of higher cognitive functions.